大家好，大家晚安。我是中式房 Sawadika. My name is Shifan, the curator of Migration Music Festival. Good evening to those who are in the same time zone, and good morning to those who are in the other side of the globe. Um, on behalf of the Migration Music Festival team, I would like to welcome and thank you all for joining the opening event, a talk presented by Professor Pomprapit Kausawadi on decentralizing musical perspective of being Thai. Because of the pandemic, we are not able to meet in person. The festival team is trying our best to keep the musical journey going. That's why we named the online version of our festival Unbroken Line. Ironically, this, to celebrate the festival online seems the only route that we can avoid being required to present um, the visa or the vaccine passports. There are no border checkpoints and, and yes, we don't need to worry about the cost of the transportation. So please join us on the road. The festival starts now and will end in November. It will be featured um, by three live concerts, three talks and one panel discussion. Follow us on the Facebook and our official website. Um, I'm happy and honored to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Pomprapit Pasawadi Ross. Ross, Professor Pasawadi is currently teaching at the traditional music department of Chulalongkorn University. She's also the deputy dean of the Faculty of Fine and Applied Arts. Her research focuses on the music and culture in the Northern Thailand, especially the Nam province. She has co-authored the book from Bangkok and beyond, Thai children's songs, games and customs with World Music Press. In 2018, she also published Music of Nam Province, an ethnography supported by Chulalongkorn University's 100th anniversary Chulalongkorn Academic Fund. Tonight, she will be leading us to a musical journey of discovering identities. The duration of the talk is approximately 70 minutes. Then we will open the floor to the audience for questions and discussions. You're welcome to leave your questions and thoughts in the chat box, or you may raise your hand. Let's welcome Professor Pomprapit Pausawadi. Ross, are you ready? Swadika, all the members on the audience tonight. Um, thank you very much, Chifon, for inviting me um, to be part of the Music Migration Festival this year, and especially today. Um, to giving a talk on the subject that I've been um, pondering over uh, 25 years after I study, I graduated, I've been working. Um, on behalf of the master degree program at Jilalongkorn University in curatorial practice, uh, we are very glad to be part of the ongoing migration, music migration festival this year. Um, so Adika, I would like to begin my talk tonight and I will try to keep it um, about 70 minutes or maybe 60 minutes. And also at the same time, please feel free to speak up, um, open up your microphone and then um, join in the discussion, um, sharing your thoughts. Um, you don't have to wait for the Q and A sessions or we, as you want it to keep it the way. Let me share my PowerPoint. The topic in between, the decentralizing musical perspective of being Thai. I'm Thai. I was born in Bangkok. I was raised in Bangkok. I haven't thought about being Thai. I was just being, growing up, trying to survive, study, being in a school, moving from one school, from a primary school 
in Bangkok to kind of suburb outside Bangkok and then moving to another school. It was just an adjustment as a girl um, getting to know a new friend, speaking the same language. I haven't thought about the word Thai very much. Um, I speak Thai, Central Thai, and also when I join a new school, it's right in the heart of Bangkok. I could feel just a little bit about adjustment, getting to know friends from different school, from different background. Um, I began I began to be checking a little bit, afraid of knowing where they are from. I was conscious that even though I'm from Bangkok, I was different from them. I started to take a Thai music lessons six years after I took piano lessons. Then I decided in high school that I quit a piano lesson. I was introduced to a Thai traditional music lessons. It was an extra curriculum activities in high school. I dive into Thai traditional music experience, start learning an instrument and decided to go to college for my music degree, majoring in Thai traditional music and decided to continue my studies in music, especially in ethnomusicology. Back then in 1995, there was not many program offering a master degree or even a PhD in music in Bangkok, in Thailand. So I decided to apply for a scholarship and I was able to be granted a scholarship to study at the University of Washington. Then my tiredness become much more evident. In my classroom, I was the only Thai student in the classroom. The majority were American students. I began to read about Thai culture because I have to explain and have to write the papers. At the same time, I was also questioned. I got received questions about Thailand. And also I could feel that there were preconceived idea about being Thai. Like, oh, I wanna to go to Thailand. Oh, I love to be in Thailand. Oh, I used to go to Thailand. Is why, I ask why. Oh, it's maybe it's sabai sabai. It's easy going. It's a land of smile. We used to be looking at a smiling face. It's a fun place to be, Thailand. How about people? They're very reserved. They're quiet. On the other hand, there's also an image of the land of free sex and also well-known for child trafficking back then and also sex trade in the country. I, I was exposed to this idea when I was in the United States being asked questions about this generalization about being Thai and also about Thailand. I got a lot of reply when I said, I'm Rose, I'm from Thailand. Oh, Taiwan. That is exactly the first um, reaction that I got. And I was like, what? I said, Thailand? Oh, Taiwan. There's a lot of people that back then in 1995, they don't know Thailand. I was in Seattle and I came across Taiwan in 1995 with this exclamation. I am from Thailand, oh, Taiwan, many, many times. When we ask someone, what is Thai? What is Thai? Oh, Thai food, I know Thai food. What is this? The famous Tom Yam Gung that has become international dish. Next, you can guess, I would put a picture of Pad Thai. What else? Thai food that became very popular and became popularized and commercialized in the international market. 
on the left, green curry, gankyo wan, or a satay, or we call, we pronounce it satay, or satay, the barbecue chicken or barbecue pork. Of course, we do have it here too. On the right, I would say, the saute on the rice is a little bit unusual. We will have it on a side and have it as an appetizer, not going with the rice. Probably this would be a picture from a restaurant outside Thailand. And of course, a famous image Sticky rice and mango, khao niu, muang, has become popularized in the restaurant as they become an international dish. What else about Thailand? Muang Thai is a tourist destination, is known for white sea, oh no, white sand and blue skies and the beaches. Those beautiful pictures, underneath those beautiful pictures, there are certain issues that we can discuss. Unfortunately, um, if you have been following the news, uh, last month in August, the government decided to open Phuket as a sandbox. So to welcome, uh, to reopen the country, just, just Phuket Island for um, for a tourist to to test if we are ready to open up the country, and there was there was a group traveling from Europe, traveling from America, and um, there's one lady who is traveling from Switzerland. Unfortunately, she got killed on site in Phuket, and. Um, Thing has not been the way that we seen on the picture, on the beautiful picture. It's really a tragedy and it becomes international um, sadness, especially between two countries, Thailand and um, Switzerland. The news could also provoke and evoke emotions, but at the same time, exacerbate and also focus on the generalizations that have been um, going around in people's mind. So they were looking for uh, a person who committed a crime, who was the murderer. Um, so the murderer was a man who was drug addicted. And she saw this tourist lady was alone strolling from a hotel um, to visit a waterfall. So um, he attacked her and um, robbed her back and found only 300 baht in her wallet. So what else? This smiling face after the news that I was just told it was hard. Thai boxing, Muay Thai, Khon Thai. And last one, Don Tri Thai, Thai music. So I've been talking about Pad Thai, Muay Thai, Pasa Thai, Thai language, Khon Thai, people from Thailand, Mueang Thai, the city of Thailand, Puchai Thai, how about Thai men? What are they like? We tend to have a general idea. Puying Thai, speaking softly, could be a leader too. Now, Ahan Thai, very tasty, spicy food. Ram Thai, Thai dancing, and Dun Thai. 
my talk will will take you through my journey and also follow the path of being Thai as I've been questioning. As I told you, I I decided to. At that time, there were not many choices when I graduated in the 1990s. When I arrived at the University of Washington as a graduate student, the first year, I was also offered a teaching assistant and started a Thai ensemble. Immediately to my mind, I never questioned what else could it be for to be a Thai ensemble, not just a traditional Bipa ensemble, or not just a Kreung Sai ensemble, a string Thai ensemble from central Thailand, from the royal court of Thailand. Could it be a Molam band to be in a world music lab for a graduate students to take their world music lessons from? Could it be a bin sim sala from the northern part of Thailand? Or could it be a, a band from the southern part of Thailand? I immediately coordinated back home, um, ordering a musical instrument and have a trip to, uh, to the United States and starting an ensemble. And at the same time, there were Another Thai ensemble, there was another Thai ensemble um, run by the Thai community. Um, I never questioned, like, why did they become interested in a Thai traditional ensemble? It was just automatically assumed that because it is a Thai ensemble and because you are Thai, and that's why you are playing Thai traditional musical instrument. But I was trained and I chose to study as an undergraduate major. The member of the community band, they work in a Boeing company. A Boeing company is a, 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 is a, is a company that building up, constructing an airplane. Um, the Thai members in the ensemble, he's, he's working in the labor department. So he putting a screw tightening the wing of the airplane. There was also an engineer working for a Boeing. There's a financial officer. Um, there's also a pharmacist in Seattle joining a, a band. And there's also uh, an American person who's working and playing with the band for a long, long time. Um, he came to Thailand as a peace court. And then he went back and get a degree in ethnomusicology and then joined this Thai music ensemble. So today I ask why only, why only Thai and Western music lessons are there in the school throughout Thailand in a university a few years, a few years ago, um, yes, you can be a Malam major, but very recently, when I was in primary school, I also asked you too, in Taiwan, maybe with many generations in the audience, I I would also like to know. Um, what kind of music lessons do you have when you were young in Taipei? If we have the audience from Tainan, can also type me in the chat. What did you study? For me, I, when I grew up, the musical materials that were being offered in a class, in a music classroom, um, I was taught to play a recorder, is a kind of flute in a Western scale throughout the primary from one to year one to year six, I was not exposed to other kind of music at all. I was introduced to um, a piano, 
and that it was the reason why I took up piano lessons since I was six. I was paying a lot of attention to the sound around me and I was not exposed to uh, a Thai musical instrument until year six when I was about 10 years old. I visited my aunt and, and she was playing a musical instrument. And I, I began to look at other kind of music. So I, and then when I changed the school, I go to a new school. There were, then that was introduced to a music lessons in Thai traditional music. Um, they, they were, there was a band at the school and it's right in the heart of Bangkok. Was there only Thai in the society and the Western people in the society? And that's why um, we have only Thai and Western music lessons in school. Until recently, regional music, um, other kinds of music in the country were introduced to be a lessons in the school. In the northern part of Thailand, when I was doing a few work in non-province, um, young generation, we see youth group forming their, um, their, their own band. They were practicing and they were forming, they were giving a concert, but not quite a lesson. It was just part of the extra curriculum activities. When I first went to my teacher and I said, in, I was in a Thai music room at a high school in Bangkok. I look around the room. I saw many kinds of instruments and I wanted first, I first, I wanted to, to learn how to play this instrument on the screen. It is a Ranat A. Around the room, there were many kinds of instruments from traditional music. And there was a boy, my friend. He sat at this instrument and he was learning. I didn't know why I came late. So I went up to my instructor and ask her if I could, could learn how to play the Renate. The answer is, you are a girl, go play, go and find string instrument. I told her, no, I want big instrument. I want heavy instrument. She said, you are small and you're a girl, go play string instrument. And I determined, I told her, I want to play banging percussion instrument. Then she sent me off to this instrument, a kongong yai. I said, it's too big. I don't, I don't, I don't want the metal sound of the gong. I don't, I don't want to play the gong. I want to play the wooden xylophone. And I have this top view of a musical instrument just to show you that. Um, I was trained to play piano before, so I was able to play a, a, straight, a, a straight musical instrument to move my hand in a straight line from left to right. And when I saw a Kong Wong, which is a circle around you, it has to go in a circle. I could feel immediately that I, I'm familiar to work with left to right rather than going around to be a curve instead of a, a straight line. So I gave up and then I, I said, okay, I will choose, I will choose a string instrument. So I went to this one, a cedar, a jacquet. It is a pluck 
instrument with three string. As you can see, you move your hand from your left to your right. So the instrument is in a, a straight line. So if you can imagine if a decay um, curve itself, I probably wouldn't choose the instrument. It would just automatically, after my sixth year of training on a piano, in a, a repertoire or a set of Thai traditional music, um, a composer also work on a musical dialect, which to the composer is trying to imitate, imitate the sound of the um, people who are living in Bangkok, who I'm talking about maybe 150 years ago. So the word samniang means a dialect, my instrument, JK, and one of my favorite piece has some niang. My favorite piece is a solo piece for JK. It is called Lao Pan. Lao, of course, refers to the country. Laos. There are 12 musical dialects that I would tie traditional composers um, playing around with this dialect. It could be in a Chinese dialect, in Western dialect that we call Farang, Pama, a Burmese, um, Yipun, a Japanese, Khmer, Khmer, in an it means people from uh, India. Their origin is from India, called Kag. Mon, the, the same that referred to the ethnic group in, in Burma and then migrated to Thailand. Yuan, the ethnic group from Vietnam. Java, we refer to the Javanese on the Java Island. Farang, as I said, Western. Ka is a group of ethnic people who live along the Thai and um, Laos border. You can find them in Nakhon Phanom, also in Sisaket. And of course, Sam Niang Thai. The the one that is missing is the Lao. Lao should be, is one of the 12, the 12 dialect. When we talk about what, when we have a meeting in order to arrange a concert or bring a group of uh, our ensemble to travel to give a concert outside Thailand, or when you think about a concert, or when you think about a cultural show, it would be a set of songs that would show a musical dialect. Musical dialects, it means, it sounds like Chinese music too, a Thai traditional musicians. But I wonder if we have ever done a research and take this samnian or musical dialects to really play for the Chinese people, for people from China um, and ask, do you think it sounds familiar? Or maybe we take it to uh, and, and perform it in, in, in Burma and then we ask them. And again, which part of Burma that we could go, which part of um, Java that we would go and ask them, does it sound Javanese to you? We never done that before. We composed, we play, 
And it just sounds like others. We thought, we assume, we understand, and that is our perspective of the others through our musical practice. It comes through percussion, rhythm, even the drums. So we change the drums for each musical dialect. Sometimes um, drums from different parts of the world are being uh, imported and then included in an ensemble. So it gives a flavor, it gives a dialect, it gives a, um, a feeling of certain part of the world. The rhythm could, could, um, could help you evoke the emotions and also um, can create the imagination. Apart from the samyang, of course, what, what have you seen? Have you seen this performance before? This one is called Kon. Kon is a mask dance and it's dated back to a UTI period. Dancer wear a mask. When you wear a mask, you cannot sing because you cannot sing through a mask, right? Even we are wearing a mask today because of the pandemic. You can try to sing under your mask. The mask danced, accompanied by a Bipad ensemble. And the mask dance played the Ramayana, the story about the demon king and a woman is called Sita. The story is narrated by a vocalist and sung by a singer in an ensemble. Faced under the mask, we cannot see. How can we communicate between the, a dancer and the audience? Can we see if the dancer can smile under the mask? Even though some of the dancers doesn't wear a mask, it's a tradition that they smile very little. Unlike this one. This is a performance, a musical performance um, from the northeastern part of Thailand is it's more relaxing. Um, you can see the face, you can see the interaction and communication between a singer on the stage with the audience. In between, there's a talk. And the lyrics telling the story about my life telling the story about being an ordinary. Unlike this one, it is about a supreme being. It is about a divine being. It's about Ramayana and um, his brother, Lakshmi. And you see in the background is the magic Banki. It's full of power. And they all are sacred, sacred, I say sacred. Um, it is more about like a ritual. But when this performance was brought to international audience, sometimes when they don't express their face, sometimes when they don't speak, maybe there is an advantage because language is also a barrier. When a performance like this, that has a lot of communication and rely on a language, you, have, you need a translator, not just a translator, but a cultural translator 
to translate the title of the song, translate um, the meaning of the lyrics. And how are you going to carry on a conversation? Even myself going to a performance like this is going to be difficult. A performance from the northeastern part of Thailand. It requires a high level of preparation, um, a teamwork to organize in order to make a communication effective and capable of expressive both the audience and also the performers that they could connect. An ensemble like this has been represented over and over when a cultural show was presented on a world stage. It is a Bipad ensemble with a cone performance. I'm I have been touching the, um, a performance that called Mo Lam, which you all will be seeing Mo Lam on Saturday. Um, I'm from Thailand and I have also, I have already mentioned that it's also difficult for me to also follow um, what the singer Thing. I probably understand about 80% or maybe 60% of the lyrics. That would be an estimation. Somehow there are some interchangeable. But I'm asking the Molam here, is, is it the same like the one that has been mentioned in the history of the song that I was just mentioned, Lao Pan solo. Um, the solo piece for my instrument, the JK. The history. This is the this is the um, historical photos um, from from the library, the national, the national library. And this is the ensemble that I was doing um, at the University of Washington in 1995. Um, why, not, uh, why not set up a Malam ensemble at the university? It never came up to my mind. Maybe I could just, maybe I, even if I was not able to do it, I could um, invite someone from um, the area, from the region, to start an ensemble, I have to accept it. I have to accept it. I, I haven't, I haven't thought of that. That question never come to my mind before. You know, um, educa educational institutions. Um, there are, there are bands. There are musical bands from Indonesia, from Thailand, from um, other countries as a lab for our students to, to, to be a bi-musicality. Um, only, only last year that my friend um, started a Molam band at the University of uh, California at Los Angeles. So I'm really excited to see the the outcome of introducing a Motlam band in, in Los Angeles, in California, um, as well as um, not just a Thai traditional ensemble. I was talking about mass dance that um, is, of course, a performance from the Royal Court of Bangkok and is being represented a performance of Thailand throughout the time. It might be a good case because they do not do the speak. They require a narrative, a narrator to tell you a story in a specific way. 
I was comparing to the more expressive performance like um, Ma Lam. And this is a Ma Lam from the Northeastern part of Thailand, dressed like, dress more like a Lige. I was having a conversation with my Lige friend yesterday that um, the Lige costume, make, costume makers um, in the past before the pandemic, they were able to um, um, earn more because Ma Lam costume is now changing, especially the um, adapted Ma Lam or modernized Ma Lam. Um, they, they adopted the Lige style costume, which means um, if you see this crystal, the blue crystal uh, adorned on the costume, that was actually coming from the Lige. Um, a Lige is a type of a traditional theater from central part of Thailand that doesn't wear a mask, singing by themselves. Um, and then after the song, they stop the song and then they carry on a conversation, asking the audience, how are you doing? Um, how are you doing today? Um, today I'm playing this uh, role and I really thank you for coming uh, to support. But a performance like Cohen would never have a chance to have a conversation during the show. And even a big smile like that too. I'm tracking, I'm tracking, tracking back to uh, a solo piece that I have been talking about, a solo piece for my instrument. The one is my favorite instrument. Um, it is called Lao Pan. The word Lao refers to the country, Laos. Pan, it means all together. So in this composition, there are seven sections. These seven sections is a, a small seven pieces that put together. When, when I was little, when I was begin to, when I began to study this solo piece, um, I, was, I was told that the story of the Lao Pan is that um, in 1851, um, King Rama IV, um, people who play Can, um, Can was very famous. Can is an instrument from Laos. And um, before King Rama IV, that was the beginning of Bangkok. There was still a lot of fighting. Um, And one of the war is the rebels. We, in, in our history textbook, it is named a rebels. Um, by Prince Anuwong in Vientiane in Laos. Um, so after the end of, like towards the end of King Rama III, it was also the end of the uh, um, Prince Anuwong war. It took place in Vientiane. So the, after the war, the Thai army came back to Siam. Siam is the old name before Thailand. And um, they took the captives from wars back to Bangkok. Among those migrations, among those migrants, there were musicians and they were playing can around Bangkok. Bangkok is a small area back then. It was just around, uh, um, around a palace. And the story goes, it became so popular that it became so popular that the king Rama IV in, 19, in 1851 is the beginning of his range. He was worried that people in the country, in Bangkok, would give up playing Thai music. 
So this is the royal decree forbidding the play of Ao Lao. The term Ao Lao is the is the uh, is the term from the past that is still a mystery. What is exactly Ao Lao? Is it the same like Mo Lam? But what we know is there is a can player. They are sitting on the ground. Um, they are also doing a dancing movement. Um, and of course, we cannot see if these two dancers in front of the photos, are they also a singer and dancer, like singing and dancing at the same time? Um, Ow. The word Ow could probably mean to sing and also to tell you a story. So what type of can would they play? This is a very long can that we saw from the photos. This is a historical photos. And um, there are those men also sitting next to a can player and uh, clapping their hands, giving a rhythmic support. We don't see a clapper or a wooden clapper. We don't see any other kind of instrument, just a can as a major instrument in this ensemble. Where were they from ex exactly? This group from Vientiane, and what were their ethnic group? And what is Ao Lao exactly? What we know is that first, they became so popular, even the king's brother loved Ao Lao, and the king's brother also play a can this instrument. King Rama, the fourth brother, play a can himself. And um, in this royal announcement forbidding playing Ao Lao, it says here, it says here that if, if they are playing by themselves, it's okay. This is the, the migrants were not forbidden to play their music, but for the residents who were here before play the, to play their own music and shouldn't be convinced too much to play music from Vientiane. What happens after this? If people from Siam or from Thailand um, did not obey or abide by this law, they will be taxed heavily. They didn't say what kind of punishment would they get, but it says that they will be taxed heavily. Would it be an ensemble like this? This is something that, um, a question that what exactly out loud is exactly, um, is it like Ma Lam today, there's a gap that being lost. So today Ma Lam performance, they stand up, they play with a, a pin, a guitar like instrument, a composer, during that time, after the forbidden law came out, composed a solo piece that imitating the sound of the can. And for this instrument, for JK, there are three strings. And um, the advantage of the three string is that you can play three strings at one time. When you strike one time, you can hear the harmony, you can hear um, two more notes adding up on the top of the bottom one. So you hear three notes at the same time. For a Renat A for Kong Wong Ya, you have two hands. So you can do maximum two notes at one time. So this is a mallet for uh, Kong Wong Ya. 
for a labranat egg or a ranatum. Again, you also have two hands and um, a mallet. You can do just two at one time. Maybe you have seen a Western xylophone or vibraphone. Uh, I've seen a vibraphone players hold four mallets at the same time. It means you can do four, four notes at the same time. For a can, you can do up to five notes at the same time. You have 10 fingers and then you hold a can. Um, more, than, more than five notes at the same time, it would be this chord. It is not going to be, it's not going to be harmonized. Um, so five notes at the same time, it is a unique character of the can and it is being translated to a decay. So I'll show the sound I was talking about. Did you hear the sound? So you can hear two string, the top and the middle string. You can hear a tremolo. You can make a long note, like when you hold a breath on a can. That was three strings together. Open string. Opens means on the first string, you don't press on any frets. Press just on the second string and then also the third string, which is a, a brass string, is also opening. So there were three positions that we can make three strings sound beautiful together. Um, the first one is on the third fret, and then the second one is going on a on a on the fourth fret up, and then coming to the first one back to the first one. So the composition is uh, about seven minutes and eight minutes. Um, it was composed by, we, again, we don't know who composed it, but we could, after tracing uh, the timeline, it, it would probably be after the migration, it for sure was after the migrations of those Laotian captive to Siam. And the can was become very, was very popular in uh, in Siam, and it was forbidden. And um, even the king and in the palace and uh, traditional musician missed those sounds. So they were they composed this composition as a reminisce for the can sound. Um, this is. A 100th anniversary of one of the master teacher, Kun Kru Tongdi Sucharit Kun. So there were 100 decay player um, gathering together and then play Lao Pan. And this is her Lao Pan solo by Kun Kru Tongdi Sucharit Kun. She was born in 1912 and she passed away on 2007. I'm going to go to a YouTube and then um, show part of it at the very beginning.
So this is the creativity and imagination of the sound of the can to be played by Arthur K. The sound of the can is like a shona. It's a double. It's a it's a reed instrument. Um, of course, I think you 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 will see it on Saturday. <laughs> And that, the downbeat, the last note that you hear is the strumming of the three string at the same time that is trying to imitate the harmonious sound from the can. Is there any question? Maybe any question from you, Chifong? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So for me, it's, it's um, the musical journey is quite personal. Yeah. So um, it's a journey for you to discover um, identities beyond Thai or Thainese. So I, as I realized questioning what is Thai is a political issue. So I'm wondering as a lecturer in the traditional music department, um, how do you manage the, the comforting ideas of um, non-Thai or um, uh, between non-Thai and the uh, the, the Thai which is invented for the, um, the doggedy that, that you are, you, are, you are applying. That's why she found the topic is set in between. Mm. Um, I'm exploring, I'm trying to understand um, myself and the meaning of what I'm doing. Um, the meaning never coming into a complete picture is an ongoing search for a meaning and uh, trying to understand. And also, I think it takes time to get into a culture, to work into um, an, a room that um, you are not accustomed to. Um, you take some time so that um, you have a better understanding, just better understanding, because uh, understanding is an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to see that the past and the present and the future, um, the past is not ending as I'm doing today, what, I'm, what am I doing today is going into the past. Um, asking more questions about the history of Lao Pan. It become more political. There is a lot of discussion about um, the rebel and why, why a can was forbidden, not just because it's too po popular, because the can, as I said, you can sing, it's very communicative. You can start a campaign and that war from the rebel was just ended and the captive was around the palace in a very small bank, Bangkok at that time. There was no telephone, there was no internet, there was no Twitter, there was no Instagram. When, when a musical tradition from the other's land become so popular. What is the meaning? So much that, so much that the city, so much that the king has to launch a royal decree, forbid this musical practice. What is the, what, it, what was he afraid of politically? Um, the question, I will begin to read the question. I think I see the two questions. What's what, the first one, what was the relationship between the Thai people and the Lao migrants at the time when the public performance 
ban was imposed. I, that is the question that I really wanted to get into as well. At the beginning, at this time, I was just guessed because they were captive. So what would the captive do? They would probably work as a rice farmer. And at that time, um, she found, maybe if you were in Bangkok before, if you know Klong San Sap, we need a lot of um, labors to dig uh, this unnatural canals around Bangkok to drain water and also to bring in water and also to travel from inside Bangkok to up country. It's a really, really long canal and there are many canals that being dug during that time. It, this is just my guessing. The second question, how is the traditional folk music of other ethnic group in Thailand represented nowadays? Represented by whom, if represented by Thai traditional musicians? It is like the way that I'm presented. Um, is the, the, the composer um, write a song um, in his imagination based on his understanding, based on the sound. Um, when, I, when I was working with my teachers, um, he would also come up, with a, a, come up with a music that based on the way people speak. Like when I go, when I went up to work in Nan province, they speak the Northern dialect. And um, we, we worked together and he composed a song. Um, a, a dialect from the Northern part of Thailand is filled into his composition. And when I asked where it come from, and he asked, he, he asked people from the Northern part of Thailand to speak a sentence that, um, is going to be a lyric. And then he notated because, um, because there it is melod also melodic. And that is that set is a basic um, idea for him to improvise and also to compose and also to add um, embellish, musical embellishment to it. And if you would like to ask the question, you can also, um, you can just turn on your microphone. Uh, yes. Um, um, I would like to know um, when, uh, when your teacher asked you to give up can to go for Chuck Hay, do you think it's because of gender or because of ethnicity or more or altogether? I really think it is about gender. Every time when I think about it, um, the percussion instrument, the bipad knowledge is dominated by male. Most of the master, most of the musicians, um, they are male. Um, the Renat egg was basically dominated uh, because of the practice, because of the belief. Um, in the tradition, if you are going to be, you, you need to be given a permission to learn uh, a, a song, there are a specific type of a song which is sacred, which is um, performed as an accompaniment to the corn performance. Because the, in corn, those characters, they are demonic, they are divine. So the music has to be divine too. In order to play certain pieces, a musician's also required to be ordained by a monk. I couldn't, I'm a female. So I think back then it's almost 40 years, almost 50 years ago. Um, I knew immediately, even, even though I was young, I knew immediately that because I was a girl, that's why I was pushed to go for a, a string instrument. Something that being seen that is lighter. Renat A is the leader of the ensemble. And also you have to be strong. Um, strong by this time, it's mean your muscle stamina. Um, you have to lead an ensemble. And in order to be, um, in order to be successful as a fanatic player, you are, you are a female, you have to compete with those male, um, male fanatic player. 
I heard from a woman teacher who is a Renat a champion, female champion in Thailand. Um, it took me a long time before I could ask her to, to talk about her experience when she, when she practiced in order to win a competition. Um, she said her, her chest, her arms, the muscle was in pain, in, especially on her chest. Um, even when thinking back to that experience, it became painful. And she stopped talking about that for a long, long time. And she stopped playing the music. And so it's my take to, to answer your question that it is really, to me, a gender issue. Um, I'm yeah. very interested when you say uh, it never occurred to you to start a Molong band uh, when you were in the US at the first very beginning. But then I was quite curious uh, in your, you know, like you are growing up experiences. Have you been exposed to uh, different kinds of uh, music, musical genres in Thailand, like a Molem or other kind of musical genres? And, or, um, or only like Western or traditional uh, Thai music? Man, this is going to go underneath my skin in order to answer this question. Yes, I was exposed to other kind of music. Um, I I was grew up with a, a lady who coming to do to clean our house as a, a worker in Bangkok. Um, there is another type of uh, popular folk music, Luk Tung. I grew up with that. Um, Back then, when I was young, like in 19, uh, in the 80s, radios, they work with the radios, they sweep the floor and they listen to a radio. There was no, uh, um, a hate phone. So I would hear, uh, I would hear folk music coming through the radio. And I remember she uh, stopped sweeping the floor and then going to a market, like maybe, a five minutes walking from my house and in order to make a phone call to a radio station and make a request and then she would run back to her uh, radio and and continue to work like cooking in a kitchen or washing um, um, the clothes and I remember seeing her like like 2 p.m she would go and then make a phone call we have a phone call in a house, but it's not allowed to make like a phone call to a radio station, even myself too. I, I cannot make a phone call for a radio station. And um, so back then I remember that was the musical genres that was exposed, including Marlam that I was hearing too, but I couldn't understand the dialect very much. Yeah. And we have a follow-up question from Xing Wen. Thank you. What kind of role does the lecturer think the Department of Thai Music actually plays in promoting Thai music traditions while also challenging stereotypes in relation to them? We're trying very hard to work against the stereotypes. Um, we ask the students to do the questions, to do critical readings. Um, allow me to share with you this project in order to answer your questions and the struggling that I've been trying to in to do the work that I feel that I'm connected the work that even though I'm part of the department of music so um, let me share the screen and then um I'll try to answer this question. So this is the, the photos that um, I took from our concert tour in Japan. This is from um, a concert in Osaka two years before the pandemic occurred. And this is Lao Pan um, in Osaka. Lao Pan is also a solo piece and also there is a, a duo danced 
that also go with the solo pieces. And that is the decay behind the dancers. I recently worked with another friend from another university that we share the idea that how can we um, reduce the gap between a Thai music performance and the audience in contemporary Bangkok, in contemporary Thai society? How can we address the issues that being human, being struggling, the issues that we wanna talk about. So um, we, we, we ran into a novel which is called The Princess Laksanawalai. Zhao Ying means princess. They start again with princess. And I think this is a very good context when I was thinking about this talk and I said, I cannot run away from the history that involved with the king. And then again, a novel that we pick up in order to do our project still has the title, Zhao Ying, Princess. It deals with gender issues again. I have answered your questions that I was pushed to string instrument. Zhao Ying Palalud Laksanawalai is a, is a musical. We want it to be a musical, but we were not able to find enough funding. So we, we were able just to do the music compositions and then we give concert. So we hope that we will be able to apply for funding and then um, have full costume on stage and do rehearsals. Zhao Ying Palalud Laksanawalai was written 90 years ago by a woman novelist. She wrote it. The main character, Zhao Ying, princess, has to escape, run away from her hometown. Her father got killed because her uncle wanted to be the next king. So she she ran away and then she ended up in a city in the southern part of Thailand. She saw a fighting, which was an arranged uh, duet fighting. The king of that city arranged the fighting in order to find the strongest um, man who could beat all the guys from everywhere who see this announcement, do sword, do uh, um, boxing. So she was watching and then she decided on the last day that she would join this fighting competition. And finally, she won the competition. Because when she was a girl, she learned the sword lessons. She learned how to fight. She grew up in the difficult times when her father was a king. In the story, in the novel, it says that the uncle, her uncle told her that, and she's the only daughter, told her that you are a woman, you cannot be a king. You cannot rule the people. You cannot rule the city. So she know that the harm is coming to her life. That's why she ran away from her hometown. The new setting is in the southern part of Thailand. And she, after she won the um, competition, the king gave her a daughter. She, so the princess was awarded a princess. It meant to be a wedding ceremony for her. So she disguised herself and acted as a man, continued to be appear as a man, as a warrior coming from nowhere is an unknown um, hero. So she married, she married this woman, the new prince, the, uh, the princess in the Southern. 
and then she ruled the city. Years later went by. The prince who was who was her fiance in the central Thai finally came to the city in the south and found out that she was a man in a disguise. So he asked her, Nong Ying, my sister, my lady, did you remember me? What are you doing? I think this question, what are you doing, is like asking not just by the prince, but is asking by the whole society, what are you doing? Come home and get married with me. Be like a woman. She said no. She would live her life like this. So her fiance went to the princess in the south and tell the truth that the husband that you think that is a man, is not a man, it's actually a woman. Now, the story shift to be focused on the princess, the southern princess, and she said, she doesn't have any problem if she's a man or if she's a woman because she loves her, she loves him. But then the princess has to keep, keep a secret and they are going to have a wedding. In the southern part of Thailand, it's a Muslim. They are Muslim. So they have to go to a, a, a ceremony for a man before they can, can get married. What, what could she do? So the story goes on. The fiance offered to go through that ceremony because of the love that she had, he had for Princess Palala Laksanavalai. And that's the, con the, the, the story goes on. And um, finally, they all um, practiced um, the way that they would like to do with their life. And that's the end of the story. So my friend composed the lyric and also composed um, composed the uh, the melodies for 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 the for the lyrics, and um, gave a concert um, two years ago before the pandemic. It was not easy to introduce this idea to the department when we talk about gender, but because there is the word princess, so it's easier it's easier to buy our way. Um, to merge the traditional music with contemporary issues. Um, and it is not easy to apply for budget because um, a department of Thai music should be doing something that is still um, promoting the music that coming from the, coming from our a predecessor and we should uh, promote the way that it should be. So um, I'm trying to introduce and then um, start our students to think about the future. Who is going to be our sponsor? Who is going to be our market? Um, can you forecast or being see the trend or any social change? Who are we, who are going to be the audience? And um, maybe it's time, maybe it's time to um, start, write the music, creating and curating a, a, a concert in a way that would answer some of the contemporary issues that some of the general audience would like to hear. <laughs>